Okay. Hi, everyone, and mostly welcome to the seminar with Hui Chao uh, that will talk about the communication and crisis, you could say. Uh, and this event is a part of the Future Week that is now being arranged in the whole University of Lund, where our researchers share the knowledge of um, different issues, questions and topics. Uh, this is a way to inviting uh, the public to the university and to spread the research that is going on here. Uh, why do we think this is important? Uh, a well-functional democracy also craves well-informed citizens. And this is also why I'm so happy that you're here to do exactly this, to spread your research. Um, I would just like to say that there will be possible to ask questions the last 15 minutes. And for you who participate uh, digitally, online, you can already now ask the questions in the questions and answer form, and we will bring them up uh, in the late, in, in later on when you are done. And of course, uh, for you uh, guys that are here physically, you can also raise the questions uh, with the mic. And uh, that was it for me. And you are very, very welcome. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first, maybe I briefly introduce myself. My name is Hui Zhao. I am a new graduate from the Department of Strategic Communication. In the past seven years, I'm doing some research about uh, crisis communication, especially from the cultural and the political aspect of crisis communication. And I also teach in crisis communication. So today, thank you for inviting me here for this talk. I will mainly talk about cultures um, when before during and after crisis. I hope we can get some more insight from this expert together by doing this. And we will also talk about uh, why and how culture matters during crisis and how we can address that from different um, types of organizations. So let's get started. First, I will invite you to look at these pictures and uh, help me to identify that something is unusual to you. Just a few seconds. Yeah, <laughs> please. Have you found something? Something different? Yeah, just, yeah, unusual just for us, like in uh, like here in Sweden, it's unusual with the animal on the street. Yeah, example. maybe on animals on the street, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's one thing, I guess. Something the, else? The thing that I thought about is the fact that, you know, the cows are holy and then you have McDonald's who has all these like beef, like cheap, quick. Mm -hmm. um, so it's this idea of something really holy and then it's just kind of packaged into these little meals. That's kind of what came up for me at least. Yes, that's interesting. Thanks. So we focus on beef and animals here. Anything else? If we pay closer look at these pictures about Michael Donner's. Something unusual? Please. <laughs> yeah, just that they're stating that it's a family restaurant. You usually don't do that. Exactly. Thanks. Thank you so much for identifying so many unusual things. These are McDonald's restaurants are running in India. So you can probably see from the cows are free to work on the street and you can also identify that. It's very special for the name in McDonald's. They have a subtitle called the Family Restaurants. Do you know the ideas behind that? Yeah. <laughs> Anyone? Anyone? <laughs> the idea behind that, to put it as a family restaurant? Yes, exactly. Yes? Yep. Okay, so I will just climb the stairs, sir, and you can wait for the mic. <laughs> I don't. Uh, it's, of course, to, to widen the, the uh, number of clients. Mm -hmm. uh, I've seen examples on family restaurants that, uh, how to say, competed out McDonald's, and that's been in um, Latvia or Estonia, somewhere in the Baltic states, where yeah. they they took 
local food exactly. from the Baltic states and started a family restaurant with all the kind of fun places uh, they have at McDonald's. So uh, I think it, it works in some countries, but not in all of them. Yeah. Culture. Thanks a lot. Actually, you catch a very key point here because, especially in India, they have a dining culture that the family need to dine in together in the Indian culture or uh, dining culture there. So try to show the respect from this dining culture in India. All these McDonald's restaurants, they have a subtitle under the main title of McDonald's. And I think we can continue to talk about beef in McDonald's. If you look at all these menus in India, we all know that McDonald's are famous for adapting to different local cultures, changing their menus constantly. But I think Indian represent an extreme kind of examples. Half of the menus in McDonald's, they are vegetarians. Maybe someday in Sweden as well, because we have a large population for vegetarians. And they also opened the first um, vegetarian restaurant in India. That is the first McDonald's vegetarian restaurant. So all through these, both from the name and also the menu, we can see how hard McDonald's try to show the cultural respect, both for the dining culture, also these religion cultures in India. But still, as a foreign company, McDonald's quite often rammed into these uh, conflicts, especially the cultural and religion conflicts when running in the different foreign markets. So we use Michael Dano as an example for cultural sensitivities, especially when a foreign company runs in a totally different nation or cultural context. Even these I mean, this uh, organize, uh, uh, McDonald's is really carefully about the cultural pact, still have the problems or create some conflicts, even crisis falling. And what about um, cultural insensitivities for those organizations? If they do not pay that much attention on the cultural aspect, what will be the outcome or consequence for the organizations? And maybe we can drift back and talk culture more generally. In crisis communication study, we look at culture from diff two different, mainly two different dimensions. First is so-called intercultural crisis communication. We talk about cultural cross nation or country boundaries, how people communicate from different uh, cultural backgrounds. We call it intercultural crisis communication, look at the cultural differences between countries. So we start with the intercultural and then we move on to multicultural, that is look at the cultural differences within one country. We take um, chopstick and Asian cultures as examples to exemplify how and why it matters. In the past two years, chopstick has created a lot of controversy or conflict, even crisis for many multicultural corporations. And uh, I think for many multinational corporations, if you ask them, please pick up one thing that you think can better represent the Asian culture. I think most of them will choose like chopsticks. Maybe jargon was too aggressive and other stuff was not close to people's daily life. So that is the many choices for these multinational corporations. They go for chopsticks. And in 2018, in November, Nadal Gabama, they launched a huge campaign in China by posting this Chinese chopstick advertisement campaign. In this series of advertisements, they depict a Chinese model was struggling to use the chopstick to eat the Italian food. And then these series of advertisements has created a large controversy in China regarding the depict of the old styled Chinese 
women and also why we need to use chopstick when eating Italian food. And then they depict it awkwardly using the chopstick by eating the great Italian food. And then they, those um, multinational corporations, they did not learn from the huge kind of uh, controversy in China. Just half years later, Burger King launched this uh, advertisement in their Instagram account. In these uh, video clips, they also depict how Western people use the gigantic chopstick eating the burger. This burger was a new burger inspired by Vietnamese favorite. So that is the way they try to represent the Asian culture and how to integrate Asian culture in their advertisement also campaigns. But this one also sparked a great criticism from Asian people, but not only from Vietnam, but also Japan and Chinese as well. So they deleted it and issued a apology after that. So from this, we can already see that it's a really uh, upset understanding how these multinational corporations understand the chopsticks in their lens or their view. But the issue for them or the important things for this international or multinational corporation, I need to understand how the chopstick is understood in the Chinese context or maybe Asian context. So when we compare, these are advertisements depicting chopstick cultures in China. This advertisement was launched in, uh, in the Chinese New Year. So they want to promote these cultural values uh, within the Chinese. You can see the chopstick are appeared in these beautiful pictures and connected to some beautiful words like longing and cleanliness and also um, inheritance and also good neighborhood or good family. So these are the way that it's Chinese or maybe Asian people understand cho chopsticks. So I think for those multinational corporations, they need to be more sensitive when they would like to use the symbols of Asian culture in their advertisement. If they really want to get some um, agreement or support from the, their consumers, maybe that is the way we need to first understand the implications, the meanings behind these cultural symbols. So then I, then maybe we need to ask, how can we do that? Or normally, how multinational corporations can do that? More and more often, those, uh, maybe you heard about that, many big companies, they are going to hire some people who have some expertise in intercultural inter relationship or international relationship. They also hire some people with uh, diploma diplomacy kind of backgrounds. In strategic communication nowadays, there was a sub-discipline called the public diplomacy. That is, they learned how to build a good relationship with this foreign um, public. So the key to do that is that we need some experts. They know the cross-cultural or intercultural knowledge or information that can help organizations to navigate in these cross-cultural settings. But you may say that maybe some of an organization, they don't have the money or resources to hire those experts in, multi, uh, in public diplomacies. So how can we do that? One suggestion is that you have a consultant that have expertise in cultural, that you have an update meetings with he or she, try to learn more if you have uh, some consumers or public in the different, totally different cultural settings. Try to catch up about what happened and how people understand cultures in their local settings. And um, the third suggestion is that if you have a company that includes people from different cultural backgrounds, that you have foreign employees, 
try to make use of them and uh, try to make use them as a consultants for uh, running in a different market. So these are devices for these daily operations. If crisis come, when you need to set up a crisis team, do remember to include those experts or use their expertise in the cultural expert. Because typically, when crisis happens in across the boundaries and in a different national context, normally people will uh, organization will go to hire a local public agencies to handle the crisis. That is the typical uh, very traditional way to do that. But the issue is that although these people know the different cultural settings, but they don't have knowledge about the organizations. So to have a bad connection between these two, please have the expertise ready when crisis come. So the most important thing is that we need to change our mindset. We, we need to prepare when crisis come, and we no, need to know when we can motivate those um, resources to get the cultural expertise ready before crisis come. Then we talk about, uh, we, we use these chopstick and Asian cultures to talk about the intercultural crisis communication. We talk about how cultural are different from country to countries. Maybe we I have gave you some round impression that culture only matters for those big companies they have a market outside the country boundaries. But actually culture also matters from the local to the local level. That is another dimension in crisis communication research. We look at so-called multicultural crisis communication. We look at how culture are different within one country or nations. That is how we face the increased kind of diversities within a society if we have some, uh, if our citizens or public are increasingly cultural diverse in a way. We will you talk about COVID-19 and the ethnic uh, minorities as examples to exemplify the importance of look at the multicultural crisis communication aspect. We talk about, so ethnicity is a very important concept in multiculturalism. I know in many contexts, ethnicity is a sensitive topic for political reasons or others. People try to avoid this concept in many concepts. But I think it's relevant for crisis and uh, crisis communication to address ethnicity, not for social discrimination or harassment, but how we can face the inequalities created by this cultural multidism. So when we look at these uh, figures, actually start from the outbreak of COVID-19 in Europe, many countries, um, the, their public experts start to look at these figures, that how, what kind of people, look at people's backgrounds who are affected by this uh, COVID-19. And the discovering was so uh, shocking because they identify that ethnic minorities are more vulnerable to the COVID-19. First, from the UK, they identify that black people are four times more likely to die from COVID-19. And all these backgrounds from the ethnicity groups, they are vulnerable compared to their white counterparts. Ah, uh, yes. Would, would it be, is it all right for a witty question now or would you like us to, to uh, wait? I think it's okay. We'll it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so if you just wait. No, it's, it's all right. Just wait for the mic. Thank mm. you. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I do not doubt the figures as such. Mm. But uh, I believe that this is both reasons for, let's say, its cultural reasons, but also, uh, please understand me right, uh, the distribution among blood groups in different, uh, let's say, ethnic groups, if I can call it that, mm. uh, are different. For sure, yeah. Uh, I, I've been working with the blood uh, group uh, project. So 
Could it be also that you have natural reasons for this kind of distribution? Yeah, exactly. You might come to it, but uh, I, I just wanted to raise the question. I, I will touch upon this, um, just so uh, we continue about that part. And uh, um, I continue with that part. As you say, there are many explanations behind these uh, consequences. But uh, what we can do from the communication perspective, we look at the communication inequality by looking at how people use the media in a different way. As you say, there are many, many factors for especially those social economic kind of factors effect a lot on this result. But uh, just focus on communication aspect, we will talk here. And then very recent uh, discovery from Denmark also showed the same kind of result. Ethnic group are more vulnerable to these um, virus. And then these are statistics from the Sweden, actually released in June, and they say that people bombed from uh, in Turkey are the highest uh, kind of infection, infected rate, and followed by those ethnic uh, kind of groups. So as we say, they are these are the phenomena we are facing now. As you just mentioned, there are many explanations and many factors contribute to these consequence of the crisis, and especially people talking about the economic factors. These people are, have low incomes, the living conditions, or maybe their natures of their ethnicities are part, part of the explanation here. But from the communication perspective, we look at how, how the multicultural media use and consumptions can also lead to these consequences here. For example, like of language barriers. I don't think many people or most of the minority ethnic groups, they don't have the same uh, language literacies compared to the natives. For example, like me, I, even though I spent seven years here, I can't speak Swedish. So the main kind of uh, uh, information I got are still in Chinese, and also some of the international media uh, kind of uh, agencies like BBC or other things, because I just literally can't read Swedish. Even though I think I still belong to this higher education, but I'm not part of the mainstream Swedish news release. So it would be the same case for other people from other ethnic groups. But one thing we can do is that, um, from the communication perspective, to minor this impact from multicultural media use, is that we provide the crisis information in different languages. It's a very, very low cost kind of endeavor, but we can change how we manage in the crisis from a societal level. For example, the second wave in Denmark is identified in the beginning of April that there was a local outbreak in a Somali community. And then ten, 10 days after, you can see the mid Utland, uh, the public sectors, they provide the information in Somali language, try to target the specific groups. These are things late, but then never. But when we think about this proactive mind of crisis management, can we do that before the local outbreak? It's something we know. They are some people, they don't really have the same literacy compared to natives. We can do that. It's very low cost. When we talk about how we can change the economic conditions of those ethnic groups, it takes many years to complex. But if we can do that, it's very low cost. But somehow we ignored these very important but low cost differences here. So we think about the language barriers. And the other thing is that how can we change the media channels? It's still a communication aspect. Because um, some of our, my colleagues, they did a research about that. Actually, Swedish, um, if you compare the media use between the native Swedes and um, ethnic groups, there was a huge difference between what kind of media they consumed every day. So for, they, they identified that they still 
listen, watch a lot from the media from their home countries or mother countries. And they also can use the social media more than native Swiss. Shocking, right? But actually, they more relied on social media. And also, they read more about these free newspapers that disseminate on the metro or things. So they are huge differences between the ethnic groups and those uh, native Swiss or natives in different countries. So when we, when we think about that, how can we address this? There was an example, actually we learned something at already five years ago when Ebola outbreak in Africa. At that time they saw, okay, the, the, the outbreak was really bad in Africa. How can we do something to, to stop that? Then BBC stand out saying that maybe we should do something because they identify the main issue is that people are not educated enough to prevent the spread of Ivers in, in Africa. Then BBC say that maybe we can try to set up a, a app in a mobile phone to help people to, to know more about this um, new virus at that time. But they found that it costs a lot of money and a lot of time to do that. So they try to do a market kind of assessment and identified what kind of existing media channel they are already used. It's, it's not difficult to understand, even though in, in Africa, a lot of people have their mobile devices. And then they don't use Facebook that often, but they use another app called WhatsApp. Almost six of seven of these, uh, especially West of Africans, they have WhatsApp installed in their mobile devices. Then they just come up with this idea, we use WhatsApp. And then they can subscribe to this so-called Ebola WhatsApp service. And every day they will push like a three messages regarding how to prevent this virus or all this information through WhatsApp. Then it was a mass kind of subscription for the WhatsApp BBC service. And it works quite a lot. It helps a lot. So that is why we try to think about the different media channels, different people from different cultures or minority subculture they used. And it's not only in the new media. This is an example from Sweden. During the COVID-19, a municipality called uh, Bushwak Please correct me, yes, if I'm, uh, I'm wrong. But in the very beginning of the outbreak, they disseminate the COVID-19 information through this radio run by the Pakistan Cultural Society. They are very minor, minor kind of group of people. But still, this is an existing radio channel and it was subscribed by many members, most of the members that within the Pakistan Cultural Society. Those people, they can't read Swedish and they need information. Most of the uh, programs are uh, canceled because of COVID-19, but still they run these um, channels and disseminate COVID-19 information through these existing but old media channels. So that is the one way we think about how we can do something to address the multicultural issues in our society when crisis come. That we already have did something, have done something to address that. But talking about how can we do something that before crisis come, proactively, because we know that from different uh, crises or previous crisis, we know that there are some problems we need to address from the cultural or language or media aspect. And how can we prepare that before crisis come? And how can we do better in the future? That is something we talk about in the future week, right? So that is something we can think. Can we get us better for the next crisis or making the second, the third wave of COVID-19, for example? 
we can do that and in a proactive way. That is how we change our mindset as a crisis management or crisis communications. We need to change our mindset to get we are ready for the crisis to come. We learned every step for for next crisis to come. Then we can do better to save more people's life in a better or cost this way. So that this is something I I prepare for today's lecture. So maybe we slightly change the title, but you know what we need to know before or we need to prepare before crisis come. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Wow. Uh, should we give her an applause? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think definitely. <laughs> wow. Uh, this was really uh, inspiring and constructive and uh, a bit confusing because uh, you certainly point out that there are issues to be worked with uh, in the future. Thank you so much, Hui Chao. Thanks. Um, I think. Uh, that I will check on Magnus now and think if we have some questions from the online participants. No, it's very, it's uh, okay, it's still there. And uh, from you here that are participating physically, do you have a question that you would like to raise to He Chao? Hmm? Yes, Magnus? Well, uh, I don't know if it's a question, but I'd like you to comment since you're working with this. Uh, there is a huge debate now among sports teams to change their logos from the Redskins, Washington Redskins here in uh, Sweden. You have uh, Frölunda y uh, uh, Indians uh, and that kind. Um, and do you see that? Uh, I mean, you're talking about Dolce and Gabbana and uh, all of that uh, debate. Um, do, do you see, uh, yeah, what is your th thoughts about that and, and that kind of movement within the, the uh, branding industry or the market, uh, the, the future for that kind of changing? You mean the wishing of the skin or? Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, so, 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 uh, yeah, I'm a sports nerd, but uh, so, so there, there is a team in in the U.S. for baseball called the Washington Redskins, mm. uh, and they have like this stereotypical uh, Native American as a symbol, and now they have to change that, and that costs you know like billions of dollars, <laughs> but they're doing it because of they're thinking that the, their market value will be going down because it, people don't want to invest in that company anymore and, and that kind of stuff. So, so it's more like, um, do, do you see that as a general trend that companies are more uh, yeah, adjusting to more of the, the signs of the times or whatever? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, you, um, you bring me to this topic because nowadays they're talking about uh, brand activism. That is that they react before they identify there was a risk or there was a controversy or issues on the society and then they react before people are start to criticize them. For example, like um, maybe it's not closely related to what you mentioned, but uh, maybe because uh, when we talk about the Black Lives Matters, not every organization uh, are involved in this um, uh, political debate, but a lot of brands start to do something to recorrect their product. For example, the whitening kind of screen was uh, they, they kind of decreased and they won't sell again. And also some other brands, they start to use some models are not very typical beauties. They are black and also in a very large size. So a lot of brands, they work in advance to prevent these criticism they expect will come to them. So nowadays, are more and more these brands, they are very sensitive to not only cultural issues, but also political debate. And they would like to act in advance to avoid some controversies here. But there are some debate, also criticism from the consumer aspect because they don't, they think it's a hypocrisy of these brands. Are you really support those activ activisms or movement in the society? Or you just want to move to a safe place that, so that people are not criticize you? So even though organization was trying really hard to adapt to any cultural or political debate, but still they are criticized for doing or not doing these things. So I think it's um, 
it's uh, quite difficult nowadays to navigate, but still, for organizations, especially for those for-profit organizations, you need to live with that and uh, still get yourself ready for all these issues or crises. But actually, you raised a very interesting movement, at least for a lot of organizations nowadays. They are doing something proactively. <laughs> yeah, but sometimes it does not work. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hui Chao. Uh, and I will climb the stairs here. Up to you. Uh, it's not, not that, that you have to run up and down. <laughs> to <stairs. Sit>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, many thanks for your uh, food for thought. Uh, I'd like to come back, if I may, to the shopstick issue. Yeah. Uh, and uh, there it could be a sign of cross-cultural uh, Communication. misunderstanding. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I remember in by the end of last century, the 20th, there were people who said, oh, it's good to eat with chopsticks here in Sweden because of you were eating much more slowly because they were struggling with the chopsticks. <laughs> but they, then they have never seen a local Chinese eating with chopsticks because that was completely different. Am I right or wrong? <laughs> you're, you're right, because we are very skillful using chopsticks, so it will not yeah, ever no, stop. No, but I, I have to just give a sign of the, the kind of mm. cross-cultural misunderstanding. Yeah. It, because of the people here, they thought something completely different than the practice yeah, in yeah, exactly. chopstick-eating countries. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just um, maybe some reflection based on you, all you have said, because I think even though we see ourselves it's a globalized uh, world today, but because I crossed the culture to here, and I can still feel that there are so many stereotypes from, from many Western people when looking at China, because you always think about and depict something I'm not even familiar with to, to try to represent China in a way. So I think that is something maybe we need more of this cross-cultural understandings and how can we do that? I, I don't have a solution, but I can still feel that the stereotype in different cultures uh, exist and did not decrease because of the globalization. But we will see how we'll go with the global now, globalization nowadays. Seems that people are more localization in a way that, so it may create more difficulty for cross-cultural understandings. So that's why we try to say more for this perspective. And uh, topic-wise, it's very interesting to see how this organization handled the crisis when it happened in a totally different cultural context. And uh, I think it creates the most greatest or greatest challenges for those multicultural corporations. If they went to these cultural issues, it's a it's really difficult to get out of that. For example, like a dog Gabbana I just mentioned, they, they can't find the Chinese model anymore because no one will, would like to represent in the dog Gabbana any anymore. That's, so that's really a, understandable. Um, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> to say. Could I ask you something? Because um, we have the Folkhälsomyndigheten, particip participants from Folkhälsomyndigheten and MSB. Mm -hmm. And before closing up, uh, could you give just three tips mm. to them, if possible. When the new crisis come, if there is one, pro my, most likely it will be some crisis <laughs> in one way or another. Exactly. What would you recommend them to think about and to, to work with preventive? Yeah, uh, I think just maybe go back a little bit to the multicultural aspect. I think it's very important for the Swedish society to think about how we can uh, include those um, ethnic, ethnic minorities into the consideration when we manage crisis. Because we know that uh, Sweden was a very multicultural society and it matters not only that we increase the communication inequality. There are many in inequality in the society, we need to face that. But from the co communication perspective, there are communication inequality. And we know that. So think about the crisis informations 
think about the language barriers and the channels of the information and really provide those groups of people clear, understandable and adoptable kind of information. They will help us to be more resilient as a society. Because we know that it's not only those people matters. It matters to the whole society, especially when we consider Sweden as a multicultural society, if we understand that. So I think ethnicity, some of the countries don't want to talk about that. But if we avoid that, they will create a lot of obstacles for the crisis management from their perspective, because we need to help them together with other native or other ethnic groups. And we have already know there are a huge differences there. And we know that what is, what are the problems. So that the step is how we can address that. As I mentioned, uh, some other fa social factors or conditions takes time to, to improve or in, to, to get it better. But from the communication perspective, the cost is relatively low, but the effects are uh, more effective, I would say. Yes. Anyone else that would like I would like to raise the last question? Yes. yes. The woman uh, here. Yeah. So in in regards to crisis communication, mm. I was wondering if your research has to like touched upon mm. uh, how did Sweden communicate with ethnicities? Did they actually kind of communicate the coronavirus? Uh, did you touch upon that? Is there a certain, you gave a couple of examples of a radio. I was wondering if there's any more research that you have done in regards to this. Uh, actually, we are working on the project and searching some money to support this multicultural expert um, about the ethnic group, how they uh, be more, can they be more resilient during this crisis. We are doing on that part, working on that part. Hopefully we can work something out. We would like to do some um, interviews with this ethnic group to really know how difference they are using the media channels and what kind of information we received during COVID-19. And we can learn more how the difference between different groups and how it matters to the outcomes of the public health kind of um, management. So that's something we trying to do and doing now. So hopefully we can um, talk, talk more next time. <laughs> yes, that's a super good question. And I, I think that there's a lot of people, also you who guys who are with us digitally, that would like really to follow up on your research. Uh, and I think that that will give us uh, the possibility to end this uh, talk. Uh, and I would l really like to say that anyone that would like to get in touch with you, yes. uh, please do. Hui Chao at yeah. the Institution of Strategic Communication. Um, thank you so much. Thanks um, a lot. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. <laughs>